Take your seats. As you can see, we have a huge problem outside. People, students doing exams to go to college, to public college. So that's why we have lots of vehicles there. But the, the Word of God says that where two or three are gathered in His name, He's among them, and He is here. So we're going to begin our service today. We're a prelude. I will ask you to remain quiet, please.
Ledger to stand. And the lecture for today is Psalms 145. So if you want to open your Bibles with me and follow me as well, I'm reading it. Psalms 145. I will exalt you, my God and my King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles, your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He shows compassion and all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of your glory, of your kingdom, they will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He's gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all their food and them as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and tears of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in, every, in everything He does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on Him. Yes, to all who call on Him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love Him, but He destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless His holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for your amazing love. Thank you because there is no one like you. And just like King David is saying here, just like he's inviting us to praise you every day and to praise you forever, we want to join to that choir of angels singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. Take this place and just take control, God, that we may be able to Praise your holy name and help us, God, to feel your presence because we know that you are here. Holy Spirit, take control of this day and we give you all glory and all honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will invite you to stand, to stay, remain stand. And how many of you hear the words of King David saying, I will praise God every day. And at the end, if you listen to the last verse, I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. This might sound silly, but are you alive today? Can you breathe today? Can you see the light of a new day? That's thank to God. And that's why we have this song. It's a little old, but I would like you all to learn it with me. The chorus is real easy. So it goes like this. Every day. It's you I live for every day. If I will ask Connie to put the lyrics there. Every day. It says, every you, it's you I live for. Every day, I'll follow after you. Every day, I'll walk with you, my Lord. Okay, here we go again. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, I follow after you. Every day, I walk with you, my Lord. We're having a little problem over there with the lyrics, but you got it, right? It's easy. So I'm going to ask the, the guitar to follow me. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, I'll follow after you. Every day, I'll walk with you, my Lord. OK, once again, every day. It's you I live for every day. I'll follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. It's easy, right? 
If you know it, join me, all right? This is a really old song, but I hope you like it. And this is for God. So let's praise Him because we live for Him. and he's higher than anything and to him and only him we praise him No. 
God, because when we are with you, nothing can stop us, God. And your word says that everything, God, works together for our good. And we know, God, that you are here. And even when we have problems, even when we have crises, trials, and a lot of things going on, God, we know that you are mighty to save. We know that you are here. And we want to worship you, oh God, the one and only, the one who sent his son, the, the beloved one, to die on the cross for us. Everyone needs compassion.
to your name and only to your name we give all glory and all power in Jesus name we say amen you may be seated <coughs> welcome isn't great to be in the presence of God now can you understand what the King David was saying it is better to be one day in your house this is what King David was talking about. Can you feel his presence? And it is amazing that you are here, despite the problems that we have outside. And I mean about the parking problems because of the students doing the exam for college. And well, I would like to say welcome to everybody. We love to have you here. And I would like to ask if do we have any other um, new people coming in this section? On my right hand, do we have anyone new here? No? Everyone's home? What about here in the center area? Do we have anyone new? I can see a family over here that you, it's the second time that you are with us, right? Second time from India, right? And the family behind from Brazil, right? We, I met Bruno this morning. Over there, who we have there? This is my family. Back there, who we have? All right, welcome. Over there, who would you have? We're from Houston, but we're here. All right, welcome. My pastors would love to say from the land of Texas. <laughs> okay, everybody, uh, anybody else over here in this section? No one? Yes, what's your name? Okay. Welcome. Over there in the back area? Nope. Who? Do we have someone else? Okay. <laughs> and where are you from, guys? Your names are? Uh, right, welcome people from all around the United States. <laughs> okay, so since we are, so since we all now know our names, why don't you go out and say hi to two or three people? This is a time that we love to say hi to everybody because we all are from the same family, right? And now it's time to continue our worship to God, but it is time to our offerings. But first, let me ask you, don't you miss somebody over here who always say, what do I love? Do you know the answer of that, right? What do I love? And when is that coming? July 30th. July 31st through August 4th. And you know what? How many, do, you, do we have kids here who have been at BBS with us before? Do we have any kids? 
or people who have help at uh, BBS, can you raise your hand? Isn't that a fun time? And parents, let me ask you something. Do you have to give a peso or a penny for your kids to come here to BBS? Have you ever wondered that? No, right? Do you know how much money we need to pay all of these lights? Do you know how much uh, we have to use all of that? Well, this is me trying to tell you what we, when we offer, when we tithe, it's not because God needs that money, but it's because it's our privilege. Because how many of you had enough food today to have breakfast? How many of you had enough clothes? How many of you can say, I have a word where I, I can take God? Well, it's us being thankful to God for all that he has given us. And I know that you have seen that video where there is a guy going to, to give Bibles away. There is the same guy going to uh, Sunday school and giving uh, things to the students there for, so they can use it. Well, that's how, we use, that's how we use all of these things to advance the kingdom of God. So it's a gratitude. So that's why it's not that God needs your money. It's you showing a thankful heart to God. That's why we give him a 10% of what he has given us, All right? So can I ask the people who's gonna help us to, to get our offerings? Say, can you help us to pray? And the kids can go to Kingdom Kids. Thank you, Bimael. You're leaving uh, when? To Haiti? Wednesday. Let's keep praying for Abimael. He's leaving Wednesday to, for a mission trip uh, to Haiti, right? So keep him in your prayers. And kids, you are dismissed to go to Kingdom Kids. And now, it's my privilege to present to you to Rick Martinez. He, is, uh, he has been with us uh, for a few months now. And he's our guest to, have, to bring the word of God. So please, welcome to Rick Martinez. You don't need this. Good morning. You know, the first time I preached, I made a joke about this thing making me look like a cyborg warrior. And really, the first time the joke really bombs, so I promise no more jokes about that. Um, it's good to be with you this morning, and uh, let me just pray, and we'll get, we'll get right into it. 
Father God, thank you so much. Um, just for everything that you're doing at Capital City Baptist Church, thank you, God, for the, the spirit that moves within this church, that moves within us through the worship, just through everybody working, through preaching, through everything that you're doing here, Lord. We thank you. God, this morning I pray as we open your word, I pray that, that we would learn, that we would grow. I pray that we would be challenged. Father, I, I confess to you this morning that I need your help to communicate anything that you have to say. Lord, I give this time, this message to you, and I pray that it's for your honor and it's for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, and I pray this in your beautiful and precious name. Amen. This morning, I'm going to be speaking about, about idolatry, okay? Idolatry. How many idolaters do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Okay, I didn't think we had many. Now, the, the thing is, a lot of times when, when us as Baptists or evangelicals, I'm sure we come from different denominational backgrounds, when we hear the word idolatry, we automatically want to tune out because it's not really... Uh, something that we, it's not something we struggle with, right? I mean, I don't know, my, I venture to guess that m not many of you have idols in your house. Maybe some of you do, but most don't. So the, the tendency when we want to talk about idolatry is immediately, okay, this has nothing to do with me, so I'm going to take a, a, you know, a 45-minute nap or whatever it is, a 30-minute nap. I want to encourage you not to nap. I want to encourage you not to check out, neither mentally nor spiritually, because I'm, I'm convinced that the type of idolatry that I'm going to talk about is something that all of us, in one way or another, as Christians, have struggled, okay? And I don't know if you've heard it the way that I'm going to preach it, but uh, we've all done it. And if you've never struggled with what I call practical idolatry, okay? If you've never struggled with what I call practical idolatry, it could very well be that when you are long and gone from planet Earth, people one day in the future will be making statues of you because apparently you are nearly close to sainthood, okay? But um, practical idolatry is something that affects all of us. Um, I'm sure you've heard of practical atheism. Practical atheism is where we live as though God did not exist. But practical idolatry is different, however, in that it acknowledges God, but just not the God found in the Bible. So practical idolatry acknowledges God, but it is not found in the, it's not the God of the Bible. So let me just ask everybody uh, a quick question that I'm also going to return to later in the sermon. If someone were to observe your worship, your life, your thoughts, your prayers, would that con person conclude that the God you worship is the God of the Bible or not? Again, if, if we could observe somehow, get an x-ray into your soul, into your mind, into your spirit, and see how you pray and how you worship and how you handle life circumstances, okay? Would the way you live and the way you react and the way you pray, would the people conclude that the God that you worship is truly the God of the Bible, or would it be a false God? We're going to look in our, in our Bibles. Please open your Bible to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 33. Acts 17, verses 16 through 33. And we're going to look how Paul dealt with idolatry, and then we're going to look how this applies to our life today in 2017. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 33. The scriptures say, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Then also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Others replied, 
he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, May we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of? For what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nation of men to live all over the earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Verse 27. So that they may seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art or imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day in which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule, but others said, we will hear about this again. So Paul went out from their presence. However, some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionys Dionysius the Areopagite a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Real quickly, I just want to talk real quickly just to set this up, how Paul ended up in Athens. Paul, before he gets to Athens, well, during his, this whole trip, he's on his second missionary journey. And he, on his first missionary journey, he went, it was him and Barnabas traveling together. But this time, he and Barnabas have a spat. They fight, and they decide to go their separate ways. And Paul decides to take Silas with him, and as well as Timothy. While they're on their missionary journey, visiting different places, preaching, starting churches, he hears a Macedonian call towards Macedonia to find out what, what God is doing there. And so he preaches and he plants churches in Philippi. He plants churches in Thessalonica. And in both places, the people begin to respond and it creates a lot of trouble. They're causing a ruckus. And the religious leaders begin to become upset about his effectiveness. And then they run him out of both Philippi and Thessalonica. They, from there, they decide to go to Berea where we, we've heard about the Bereans because they were studious and, and they were excited about the Word of God and they studied the Word of God. And again, God was using Paul and God opened people's eyes. The people that were in Thessalonica heard about what was going on in Berea, so they come down and they start stirring up trouble there as well. And they run Paul out again. Okay, so Silas and Timothy, for whatever reason, they decide to stay in Berea, and then the brothers, the Berean brothers, decide to take the Apostle Paul over to Athens, and that's where we find um, ourselves here in this verse 16. The first thing I want you to notice is that Paul, that false belief manifests itself in false worship. Okay, we're going to see that false belief always manifests itself in false worship. Uh, the, the scripture, it starts out this, this way. It says, when he was waiting for them in Athens, when Paul was waiting for uh, Silas and Timothy in Athens, 
My version of the Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, says that his spirit was troubled within him. Why? Because he saw that the city was filled with idols. You know, the, the Athenians, was, Athens was a city just, it was a plethora of different gods and different deities. Everywhere Paul went, strolled, observed, all he saw were idols. Um, William Barclay, a commentator, says that they were in Athens there were more statues of the gods than in all the rest of Greece put together. And that in Athens it was easier to meet a god than another person. And we can understand this, the word there that, that says troubled, it, it can also mean, other versions use provoked. Um, it distressed Paul. Why? Because we know that Paul understood the scriptures. Paul understood who God was. Paul would have instinctively known that walking through Athens and seeing a city filled with idols, know that these people, without really knowing about it, were violating commandments one and two, which are commandment one, you shall have no other gods before me, and commandment two, you shall not make any graven image. And so here's Paul, a man who loves God. He walks into Athens and he just sees all this idol worship going on. And the scripture says that he was troubled. He was provoked. Why is idolatry so offensive? I mean, there's lots of reasons. Number one, it makes a mockery of the true and biblical God. It also places God on an equal plane as creation, right? Think about it. If I can make a God something that I'm going to venerate or worship or speak to or pray to, I can make this thing, be it small or big, then that means I'm putting myself as a creator on the same plane as God. And that would have been something so blasphemous to Paul, a good Jewish man. It also means that man can even destroy deity. A commentator said that not all deities had its own idol, but if an idol of that deity did exist, the fate of the deity was bound to the fate of his idol. Therefore, that if the idol was present, the deity was present as well. And get this, if the idol was mutilated, that means that the deity was mutilated as well. Well, therefore we see that that man now becomes a manipulator of God, right? If I can destroy my deity, if I can threaten my deity, you know, uh, because the, the deity's present there, if your idol's present, if I can do that to my deity, that means I can control my deity. And we just, we know that that's, biblically, it's, it's totally wrong, you know, um, I come from Miami, Florida, and uh, of Cu uh, Cuban background, and in Miami, there's a lot of people that, that practice this religion called Santeria, okay? Uh, I remember growing up, there's a, there's a saint called San Lazaro, Saint Lazarus, you know, and it's Lazarus that was with the rich man, the rich man never gave him food, so he always had dogs, you know, the statue was always Saint Lazarus with a crutch. And he always had dogs around him. And I know in Miami, what a lot of the people do, well, not a lot, some of the people do there is that in order to control their deity or, or this, this saint that they're praying to, you know, they want something from St. Lazarus. Many of them would take a string and they would tie the string very tightly on St. Lazarus' toe, okay? And they would petition St. Lazarus and they'd say, St. Lazarus, if you don't give me what I'm asking you for, I'm going to keep tightening that string, causing discomfort to St. Lazarus. And then as soon as St. Lazarus or any of the other saints that they, they pray to or venerate, as soon as their petition is granted, you know, they, un, they remove the string. So we see that man himself becomes a manipulator of God in idol worship. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 15. You can just listen. He says, Not to us, Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, 
made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot hear. I mean, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet that cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throats. And get this, this is a warning to everybody. Those who make them are just like them, as are all who trust in them. What the psalmist is saying is if you place your trust in an idol, there is no life in that idol. There is no spirit in that idol. That idol, that thing can't do anything for you. Why? Because it's as dead as the person who's appealing to that thing. That's what the psalmist is saying. For worship to be true, its object must be something true, real, and alive. Idol worship, on the other hand, is empty. It's useless and leads to death because objects being worshipped are empty and dead. Idolatry, it's interesting. If you really think about idolatry... It's always something that comes from within man. So if I'm going to fashion an idol, where does the image of that idol come from? It comes from my own creativity. It comes from my own mind. So it comes from within. But revelation, okay, what we know about God cannot truly come from within. It comes from a source outside of us. So idolatry is always something that we invent. But true the true worship of God is something that we have to learn from outside of us through the scriptures. Troubled, provoked, irritated. It made him angry. He knows his doctrine. He also, knowing Paul's conversion, he has met the living God. He met him. I mean, he saw him. He got thrown off his horse. He heard the voice. He saw the light. He spoke directly to Lord Jesus. So he just knows. And this truth just causes so much... God is a God who is alive. And because of that episode on the Damascus Road, Paul was totally transformed. His life was so overtaken by the true God. The true God so infiltrated his heart and his life that what troubles the, God, the heart of God also troubles the heart of Paul. You know, I don't know here in... Uh, there's different forms of idol worship everywhere in the world. It's not limited to any one country, any one region... It's all over the world. But it's interesting. I wonder if idol worship bothers us as believers the same way it bothers Paul. Or is it that we've just accepted it? We see it in all its forms. It's so prevalent and pervasive that, that we just kind of, okay, that's, that's how it is. And I'm not, please don't hear me that I'm picking on any particular religion. Any religious system that relies on any type of idols, it's false. It's a sin to be worshiping or venerating those idols. And I pray, and this goes with idol worship, I pray with anything that troubles the heart of God. I pray that we as believers, when we see something that troubles God's heart, may it trouble our heart as well. And if it doesn't trouble our heart, may we just go to God and surrender to him and say, please, Lord, give me your heart. Paul was sensitive to this. He was a discerning believer. And so he sees that the city is filled with idols. It provokes his heart. It causes a reaction in his heart. And that reaction causes Paul into action. Okay, we're going to see now in verses 17 to 23 that true, the, the first point was that false belief undergirds or false belief leads always into false worship. And here we begin to see how Paul tries to instill in his hearers that true belief will undergird true worship. 
And so he's there. He sees the city is idol, uh, filled with idols. Verse 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God in the marketplace and every day with those who happen to be there. Um, it's interesting. Paul, right? Remember, Silas and Timothy, they're still in Berea. Okay? And so Paul's there in Athens. He's, he's, you know, he's trying to learn. It's interesting what Paul does. As he walks through Athens, he's learning. He's observing. I, I really believe that he was trying to learn as much before he was going to speak about Christ. He, he, he was trying to, to learn all he could about what was going on there. But he was, get this, he was proactive. When he saw something that troubled God's heart, therefore troubled his heart, he was proactive. He didn't just stay by the, by the hotel. Uh, uh, a Yoli, you guys drink Yoli? You know, he wasn't just having soda, uh, sunbathing. He wasn't at the Starbucks drinking coffee. He went into action. And so it says here that he reasoned. It's, it's he debated he debated because we know that people who are steeped in idol worship, they're not just going to come to faith. It, they're not just going to change what they believe just because you real quickly tell them about Jesus. So it says that he did this every day. And look who he, who he reasoned with. It talks about how he went into the synagogue. Therefore, he reasoned with religious people. You know, the, we need to reason with religious people about the things of God, about the truth. Uh, he re it says that he was in the marketplace as well. Therefore, uh, he, he reasoned with merchants and shoppers. Or we could say, you know, blue-collar, hard-working folk. In, in verse 18, it talks about how he reasoned with philosophers. These are the intellectually curious, you know, the intellectual elite. And, and uh, after, in verse 21, it talks even how he reasoned with foreigners. But his job at this point, seeing that there was false belief that led to false worship, his job at this point was to introduce right belief that hopefully would lead to correct and God-honoring worship. And what does it say in verse 18? It says that he talked about the good news uh, of Jesus Christ. And just a, a, just a quick side note, it mentions the Epicureans, it mentions the, the Stoics, and my point, is, my point here is not really just to talk about how, how, who all those people are, just to know that they're people who had very definitive goal, ideas about what God was, or what how, the nature of the universe, or the world. And when they heard Paul, you know, they called him a, a pseudo-intellectual. They called him a babbler. Other people accused him of introducing uh, new deities. But verse 18 says that he, be, he was telling people the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So his form of attack, and maybe that's too negative a word, but his way of beginning to introduce the truth is just talking about Jesus. And I think that teaches us something. We, we don't have to be... Uh, uh, PhDs in theology in order to talk to people about Jesus. We understand that what people need is Christ, and that's all he did. He talked about the good news. What is the good news? That man in their sin, in this case idolatry, are separated from a holy God because God is just and can't allow sin into heaven. And that us, using our own strength, our faculties, our intellect, everything that we cannot get to God, therefore God sends Jesus to this earth to die on the cross for us, rose from the grave, proving that he's alive, and that God accepted his sacrifice. And that's all Paul did. That's good news that there's hope for every single person, no matter how bad our sin is. I mean, you could agree that, that this type of, it's a pretty bad sin, but what Paul is doing is he's giving them hope. I don't know what sins we have all committed. I'm sure some of them are pretty bad, you know. I wouldn't want my sins projected there, but God, you know, the good news. I heard it, and you heard it, and God changed us, so there's hope for people who are steeped in this. So he preaches, he preaches the gospel. 
He talks about Jesus, about his love, about his forgiveness. And what's interesting, when he mentions Jesus, it's a male word. And when he mentions resurrection, it's anastasis, it's a female word. So people thought he was talking like about a married couple God. That's why they say here, he's, he's a preacher of foreign deities. And it's interesting because Paul's intentionality bore fruit. Okay, it bore fruit. Paul, being intentional, being bold, giving people what they needed, not just what they wanted to hear, God used that and blessed his efforts. Therefore, in verse, for instance, in verse 19, it says, they took him to the... Uh, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus. And some of them said, may we learn about this new thing that you're talking about. And verse 20, uh, others said, for what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these ideas mean. So Paul's effort began to bear that fruit. And so they're saying, Paul, listen, we don't quite get it. But what you're, what you're saying is interesting enough that we want to hear more. So uh, the next portion in verse 22 is the Areopagus address. The Areopagus was a big stone, like a mountain thing. It was a big stone hill. And it was where uh, there was a, like a council that would meet for, to judge uh, legal matters, but also in the area of religion, when somebody like Paul would come to Athens and begin to introduce some type of new deity, okay, uh, they would bring them before the Areopagus, it's kind of like a council, and then that council would hear it, and they would judge whether these new deities would be included in all the other gods of the city, which is real interesting to have uh, idol worshipers, you know, judge Paul's preaching, but that's, that's what was going on here. So they wanted to know more. Paul goes before them. Uh, he begins to, to teach up about Jesus. And, um, you know, he says, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. I think Paul, he wasn't being sarcastic here. I think Paul was acknowledging that they were people that were seeking something. Right? I don't think he was making fun of them. He was saying, look, God in his sovereignty is doing something in you. And not only that, I was walking through your city and I see this altar to the unknown God. So here are these real religious people, but yet they still didn't know who the true God was. And Paul says, man, I'm, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to, what, what you worship in ignorance, I'm going to let you know who this unknown God is. So he did not talk down to them. He respected their, their religiosity, but he wanted them to get it right. He wanted to build upon what they already had in them. So he says, this, therefore, what I worship in ignorance, this I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, I want to stop right here in the text because, again... That's what was going on in the historical context, but the, the real question is, what is it that we need to take from this? Okay, what to Baptists and evangelicals and other types of Protestants, what can we learn from what's happening here? One thing is that the way that we or people worship and live reveals what they truly believe about the nature of God. Okay, in the case of the Athenians and others present, their false worship revealed that they were spiritually sick. And so Paul, spiritual sickness and their false worship, and he says that it's ignorance. Ignorance is a very strong word, but in this case it just means that they didn't know any better. So anytime we see that for the most part, it's because just people don't know any better. And it's our job as Christians to help people in a very loving way. Sometimes gentle, sometimes bold. It depends on the context, but that's our job. God wants to use us to eliminate ignorance, religious ignorance, from all people steeped in this type of thing. The thing is, brothers and sisters, that we, okay, we are not ignorant. Again, I'm assuming that we all believe in one God and that we don't have physical idols in our, ho in our house, how is idolatry usually applied in a, in a non, in a 
you know, evangelical context. Usually when we speak about idolatry, um, it's taught, and this is very valid, it's true. We usually like to talk about how money can become an idol. I'm sure you've heard that. Anything that we devote ourselves to, it could be money, it could be uh, sports, it could be food, it could be a, a relationship, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, a husband or wife. We can even make kids an idol as well. And again, that's totally valid. I, I want to just put a little twist on it. I'm going to go back to the question I asked in the introduction. If someone were to observe your worship, if someone were to observe your life, how you pray, when things start going not so correctly in your life and we were to video that, what kind of conclusion would we make about the God that you worship? Would we find that we are worshiping the biblical God or are we worshiping some other God? And let me just give you an example. Again, when problems in your life begin to multiply, me, okay, you, you just, you begin to freak out, you begin to lose it, okay, what does that reveal about our God? Okay, your car breaks down, or your money runs out, or whatever, and you start to just, you know, start feeling stressed and start feeling nervous, what does that reveal about our God? In essence, it reveals some things about us. In essence, we believe that we really are the controllers of our destiny, right? When we lose control, when we freak out, we, it reveals that we think we've got all this life under control. It also reveals that, in essence, we don't believe that God has control. Think about it. When we, when we behave that way, believe that way, we're saying, God... Whatever's happening in my life, you're just not big enough to take care of it. You don't truly understand what's happening here. God, you're not able to control and to help and to fix what's happening in my life. But we know, if we know the scriptures, for instance, Colossians 1.17 says that God is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Okay? So we go and we appeal to the truths of the scriptures. When things in our life starts to spin out of control, we stand on those truths. But if we freak out like I do every once in a while, and we feel like stuff is not happening and God doesn't know what he's doing, what we're doing is that we're praying and we're revealing that we don't believe that God is the true God. In that case, God is weak. In that case, God doesn't know what he's doing. In that case, the, my problems are too big for this God. He's not omniscient. You know, he doesn't know everything. So that's how our practical idolatry begins to reveal itself. How about this? Um, have you ever struggled to believe that God can truly love you because of your sin? Whether it's past sin or present sin or perhaps sin that you might commit in the future? I mean, does anybody else struggle with that? Does Satan still have that kind of hold in your life that you don't, you don't believe that God could really forgive that X, Y, or Z? And so, man, I, you know, Christians, we feel, a lot of us, we run around, we talk about forgiveness and we talk about God's mercy, grace, and love, but we run around feeling guilty. Some of us. Maybe it's just me, okay? I don't know. I do sometimes. Uh, I got saved when I was 21. I did a lot of sinning before I was 21. My kids are out of here, right? Okay. They're just little sins. But, but sometimes we carry that around. Even we may have been saved 20 years, 15 years, 5 years, 50 years. So what, what, how does that reveal our practical idolatry? It reveals it in, in, in this way. In, um, we believe in a God. If we believe that, if we struggle with that, we're believing in a God that truly cannot forgive fully all sin. Okay, so God really isn't a God of forgiveness. Also, we believe that God enjoys 
hanging this stuff over our head and over our life. Okay? We believe, man, my, my, my Father in heaven, you know, he keeps beating me up with this. So now we believe that God is not an all-loving and all-good God. Don't you see that when we behave that way, we're not truly worshiping the biblical God. You know, what, what does the scripture say? Uh, Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, listen, no condemnation now exists. For those that are in Christ Jesus. You need to go in your Bible and circle that. No condemnation exists for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Whatever you have done. Whatever you have done. I don't care what, what sin you've committed. In Christ, if you are in Christ, you are set free and there's now no condemnation. We have to hang on this. Hang on that. Bet our life on it. Why? Because the scripture is true. It can't lie. And God is true. A third way is we believe that God just doesn't know what's best for your life, for your job, for your kids. Okay? Uh, those of you who are coming from different countries or if you've lived in other places, sometimes we always think, and I, again, I'm, maybe I'm confessing a little bit too much right now. I've been on the mission field 15 years, and I'm always struggling with wanting to go back to my, my, my country and be back with my family. I, it's just, I think it's a natural thing. Um, and a lot of times when I feel like God is not giving me what I want, you know, and I'm starting to boo-hoo about, about my plight in life, which is, is very blessed, by the way. But what I'm saying to God is, God, you have me here or you have me there, and you just don't know what's best for me. That's what I'm telling God, right? Because I'm telling God that I know better than he and it's just not true. So the truth is that if God has me here, I've lived in Bolivia and Ecuador and Venezuela and all these places. If God has me in those places, it's because he knows better that I need to be there. It could be about your job. Any of you complain about your job? Always looking, the, 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 you know the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. You know what I'm saying? We're, 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 we're always thinking that something is better out there and it's just not true. If you believe in a God who doesn't know what's best for you, then you're worshiping a false God. And that's practical idolatry. Um, other, another other ways uh, is that we try to manipulate God. Just like uh, my, my people in Miami, they try to manipulate God, tying strings on them. We do our own evangelical way of manipulation. Perhaps we say to God, God, listen... I believed in you. I surrendered my life to you. I've been, I've been really praying a lot. I've read my Bible 15 days in a row, and you still haven't done whatever, you know, X. I wanted this, so, you know, I'm going to pray hard, and, and then God gives it to you, or he doesn't. So that is a way that we manipulate God. Or God, I've gone to church faithfully. Man, I'm even a teacher in the Sunday school. I'm a missionary. I visit the sick and the prisoners. I've given up everything for you. So why don't you do X for me? Again, I know better than God. I'm trying to manipulate who he is. So it contradicts what we know about the true nature of God. As revealed in the scriptures, we are revealing our practical idolatry. True worship is not just believing rightly, but living and responding to all of life and every circumstance in light of what the scriptures reveal about God. Now, real quickly, I'm going to... Um, Paul, when he addresses the Areopagus, I mean, he's got this incredible sermon. I'm not going to try to talk about every single thing in, in much length. But this is just to... to Remember, Paul's job was to introduce right belief... Uh, about God, 
teach about the true nature of God, if you, if you struggle with this, he says seven things, I'm just going to run through them real quick, that I'm, I'm praying will, will encourage us in our faith. So he addresses them, and he says, um, he starts... Well, he says, men of Athens, you are religious in every respect. I see this, this, uh, this altar to the unknown God. He says, therefore, I worship in ignorance, and this I proclaim to you. So he just starts to preach it, and then seven reasons why uh, that I think should encourage us in our faith. These are not just platitudes, but I think foundational truths upon which we base our life. Verse 24. He is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. First thing is that we see that God is a God of power. And if you believe in the God of power, um, we can trust in that power. So therefore, there's nothing that the power of God cannot do in your life. So he, he begins to talk about that. Obviously, trying to... to uh, compare the power of idols to the power of the true God. And then look at, look at the provision in verse 25. He says, Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Okay? Provision. God, every, listen, everything that you need for your life, everything that you need for holiness, for godliness, Everything that God knows that you need for your life, it says that he provides everything. So we can trust in the God of power. We can trust in the God of provision. Okay, it says, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Verse 26, from one man he has made every nation of men to live over the earth and has determined their appointed times. He has given us appointed times. That means he has given us purpose. Okay? Your life, everything in your life, where you work, where you minister, who your wife is, who your husband is, uh, uh, everything, every, who your children are, God says he has appointed these times. Therefore, purpose Nothing is by accident in this life. He also mentions, and not only does he give you a point at times, he appoints the boundaries of where you live. That means that God has given you a place. Okay? He has given you a place. Where you live is not by accident. Whatever colonia you live in, God set that up. Okay? God placed you in the house or the apartment that you live in. Why? Look what verse uh, 27 says. So that they might seek God. Who? They. The people that surround you. And perhaps they may reach out and find him. Okay? So he gives us power, provision. There's purpose. There's a place. You're not there by... And then there's participation in verse 27. For the rest of your life, wherever you are, God wants you to look at those who are around you, okay, as your mission field. He allows us and he gives us the privilege of participating in what he is doing in salvific history. Verse 27 also says, uh, it says, uh, so they may see God, so they may reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Friends, there's proximity. God promises in his word that he is near us. He's near us today. He is near us tomorrow. Jesus says, I will be with you till the end of the age. Therefore, every day, every day we should go and seek God. Why? Because he is near. And then in verse 28, it says, for in him we live and we move and exist, as some of even your own prophets have said. There's presence. We are present here. We live here. We breathe this morning. Only because God has given us the precious gift of this day. Of this day. We're not guaranteed five minutes from now, five days from now. But we have 
just this moment, right? It's a precious gift of God. So we're present because of God and His power. And then look, verse 29, he mentions being God's offspring. Basically, if we believe in Christ, we're His sons and His daughters. God, I don't know. I don't know if all you guys have had perfect fathers or mothers. Um, maybe, maybe not. But what God is promising here is that, that we are his offspring. Okay? And um, he is our perfect and all loving father. And as we as, as his offspring come to understand, we need to come to understand that he will never, God our father will never let us down ever in this life to those who are his sons and daughters. And then to conclude it all, okay? So all these things, power, provision, presence, everything, all these wonderful things about our God, Paul just concludes in verse 29. He says, therefore we shouldn't think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. We don't need to be practical idolaters anymore. Um, I, I'm, I'm praying that these truths in the Bible will help us so that when things start to kind of unravel a little bit, we know who to go to, what we need to hang on to, what we need to believe. And it's interesting, uh, when, after Paul preached about Christ, about Jesus, his resurrection, after he preached these awesome truths, the scriptures say that the people responded in one of three ways. Uh, it says that some ridiculed, some became more interested in the Lord, but it also mentions that some believed, okay? So my hope and my prayer for you this morning is that based on these scriptures that we would just believe. That we would believe. And get rid of, and I know it's tough, I'm not saying it's easy, because we're human, but we can trust in this God. For no matter what's happening in the world, we can trust in this God. And so let's, let's just cast off, it, it says that he called the people to repent. So let's repent of our practical idolatry and trust in the true and faithful God. Amen? Father, thank you so much for this day, this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And um, God, why wouldn't we trust in you? Why wouldn't we believe in you? Why wouldn't we just give it all to you and say, here I am, and you do with me whatever you will, whatever you desire. Why would we entrust our lives and our souls and everything else in false idols? Be it money, success, relationships, or be it practical idolatry. Why would we trust in a God who is not true, Lord, but you reveal to us the truth? And I pray that every person in this room, whether they're Christian or they're thinking about becoming Christians or they just don't know what they are, I pray, Lord, that they, this would speak to their hearts God, that your word would work right now this morning, this afternoon, into the night, Lord. And just whatever you want to do, God, we leave it up to you. We thank you, Lord. You're beautiful. You're precious. You are our God most high. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'll be honored by all today. And we thank you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for that message. And today is the last Sunday of the month. And as you know, uh, we collect an offering, change for a change. So if you, do, if you have your boxes with you, can you, bring, can you bring them here and let's collect this offering. And I will invite you to stand as we are dismissed. We have one more song.
So if you can stand. Not being practical idolaters. The day is coming, I believe, and we have to be ready. To be ready for that day when we can face God and to be just in His presence. Miss, and just for let you know, uh, Sandra just finished this morning 39.3 miles. That's like marathon and half. That's like 63.20 something kilometers. So, praise God for that. And we are dismissed. Uh, it was great to see you. God bless you.